part of the reason that I like working through a project like we've been over the past few months on YouTube is that it really forces me <laughs> to be on my best behavior. I'd like to think, or maybe I'd just like you to think, that I have my stuff together and that I always practice what I preach. The reality is that we all have room to improve. A few episodes back, I talked about the value of having pseudocode to help separate the what from the how of programming. I mentioned that the nice thing about pseudocode is that it gives you some ready-made comments to make your code more readable later on when you come back to it after, say, a couple days, a week, months, maybe a year. Well, folks, I have to come clean. But before I go all confessional on you and I have to beg you for your mercy, let me tell you, I'm Pat Schloss and this is Code Club, where we learn about reproducible practices to improve our data analysis skills. Please be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit that bell icon so you know when the next episode is released. But don't hit it too hard, you might need that mouse a little later on. Alrighty, here we go, confessional time. When I write my code, it rarely has any comments. There's a lot of debate online about how many lines of comments you should have per line of code. Some people think you should code so that you don't need comments. Another way of saying what they're, they're trying to get at is that your code should be self-documenting. Self-documenting means that variable and function names are descriptive enough so that when you read your code, you understand what's going on. Others think that you should have lots of comments. Others are just jerks, <laughs> and they think the number of lines of code should be inversely proportional to your experience writing the code. Jerks. It's probably somewhere in between having no comments and having more comments than lines of code. But one principle that I've read that I really like is that your comments should indicate why you are doing something rather than what you are doing. After all, the code you are writing should show what you are doing. Something I want to emphasize, however, is that we all think that our code is crystal clear when we write it. The variable and the function names, they all make perfect sense and the logic is just flawless. The reality is that a day, a week, a month, again, maybe a year later, a lot of that clarity and logic is just gone. Don't get me wrong, the code might do exactly what was desired. The problem is we don't remember what was desired. This happened to me recently. I was thinking about what I should do next in our analysis and saw that I had this file called doodle.r. Really, it's called doodle.r. I'm sitting on my desktop that had R code analyzing something about the frequency that different amplicon sequence variants, or ASVs, appear in genomes. Basically, we've shown that E. coli has more than 1,000 ASVs, but are those all equally likely, or is there one that's dominant over the others across the E. coli genomes? Looking at the code, I realized I wasn't really sure what was going on that I had written in the code that I'd written maybe only a week ago. I suspect I'm not the only one that doesn't comment enough or that has come across some old musty code that's poorly commented. For today's episode, I'm going to show you what I do when faced with this problem. It's also a common problem where we get code from somebody else that perhaps hasn't commented and we're trying to figure out what's going on. So we're going to improve the documentation of this code. In the process, Hopefully, we'll learn a bit more about R coding. I don't think there's anything novel here, there's no new syntax, but it'll give us another chance to see how mixing and matching different functions can allow us to answer a diversity of questions. Even if you're only watching this episode to learn more about R and don't know what a 16S RNA gene is, I'm sure you'll get a lot out of today's discussion about commenting. Please be sure to check out the blog post that accompanies this video where you'll find instructions on catching up, reference notes, and links to supplemental material. The link to the blog post for today's episode is below in the notes. Let's go ahead into our project root directory and we'll open up our studio. And you'll see that my master branch there is red indicating there's something in here that hasn't been committed. And as I mentioned in the introduction, um, I went ahead and I copied my doodle.r file that I found on my desktop into my project. and Looking at it here, um, you'll again see there's how many lines of code? Maybe 50 lines of code or so. Um, and I've got some like conclusions listed. Um, I've got some notes about what's going on, um, but it's it's not really clear what, what I'm doing, right? So I talk about like genome basis, operon basis. Um, I have the kind of the the motivating question, maybe there, are, maybe there are many ASVs, but only a handful of them are dominant. Um, 
genomes numbers, right? So I think I meant <laughs> to have this as being um, self-documenting, but at the same time, I'm not really sure what these things mean. Also, metadata ASV is here, but where did I define that? No doubt, as we've seen in previous episodes in the exploratory data analysis, we redefine metadata ASV many times. So I'm gonna go ahead and create a new R Markdown document that I'll copy all the stuff into. Let me double check how what my convention has been for naming these files. So it looks like I'm using the date and then a brief title. So I'll go ahead and do new R Markdown and I'll do 2020 hyphen 1102 hyphen 02. And we'll say uh, dominance, um, commonness, of ASVs, I'm sure I'm, oh, there's like three M's in there. Yeah, that's that's definitely misspelled. Let's go ahead and put in two N's just in case. <laughs> I think it's just one. I don't know how to spell. All right, um, and we'll go ahead and click OK for that. And we've got this um, basic R Markdown document. I'm gonna come back to a previous R Markdown document that we used from the past couple of episodes. Um, and I'm gonna copy a lot of this material from where we define metadata ASV and all my other and all my other presettings. I'm not sure what happened there. So um, and let's see. I'm just gonna remove all this stuff, put that in there, and yeah. So let me fix the date. So it'll be 11:02 on patch loss, and we'll say. Um, quantifying the dominance and commonness of ASVs. All right, so that should be good. Um, and all this other stuff uh, from output down, I'm gonna merge uh, my two sets of headers. And I, I still prefer the chunk output to go to the console. Um, it just works better for me for some reason. Um, and again, here in this first code chunk, we have uh, the libraries that we're gonna load as well as our metadata, the information about the taxonomy for each genome in our database, as well as a count of the number of times we see each ASV in each genome. Metadata ASV then merges that information together. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back to my doodle.r and um, copy and paste, okay? And before I forget, I'm going to go ahead um, before I forget, I'm going to go ahead and save this. I don't know why it didn't save it as the file I wanted it to be saved as, but we're going to do it into exploratory 2020.11-02. Dominance, commonness of ASVs. And so that's saved as our, our markdown document. And I'm gonna convert the comments I have to being text, and I'll go ahead and put in uh, my headers for my code chunks, as well as uh, closing those out, right? Um, and I think there's another one here where I do the analysis in a different approach. Close that out, and then these are my conclusions. And I think before my conclusions were what level? Third level. Okay, so I'll put three pound signs, and then this is all the conclusions, and um, I'll go ahead and, ah, why does it do that? Remove those comment signs, and there we go. So I had been using comments to say what we saw, or what I saw previously when I was doing this, um, and in our markdown, then that becomes the main text, and of course, as we've seen before, our code goes into these code chunks and, um, and, and as you can see, I don't really have um, much by way of comment in here. Um, so what, what percentage of genomes have an ASV? Uh, I think all the gen genomes have some ASVs, right? Um, that this focuses on the most common ASV for, mo for each species. So I kind of get a sense of what's going on, but the overall question as I put into the comment was I want to know um, if we look at say all of the E. coli genomes, um, what is the most frequent ASV? So what ASV shows up 
in the most genomes and what fraction of the genomes is that? So I'm more interested in um, how many genomes or what percentage of the genomes does the most frequent ASV appear in, okay? So is there one ASV that's in everything? Another way of thinking about it is, um, you know, so if we say E. coli has a thousand ASVs and there's like 900 genomes, so there's, you know, if there's seven copies, then there's like a total of like 6,300 operons, E. coli operons in the database of that 16S gene. So how are those thousand distributed across the 6,000, right? So is there again one um, that shows up in nearly, that, that's like 90% of um, the ASVs or the operons um, in the data set? And I think those two distinctions of what shows up in the most genomes is probably what this genome basis was about. And this of what is the most common operon or ASV across operons is this operon basis. So let's go through the code and try to understand what's going on. All right, so this first one, genome numbers, um, again, I'm not totally sure what this is going to output. And what I prefer to do is not assign things to a variable until I'm ready, right? And so what we're gonna do as we go through here is we're gonna think about how can we add commentaries about why we're doing things as well as can we perhaps improve the naming of our variables and na variables because we're not, we don't have any functions we've defined. Can we improve the naming of variables to um, give a better sense of what's going on here? Okay, all right. So now if I run this code chunk, sure enough, it outputs it to the console. I got asked it to. And so again, trying to figure out what this genomes numbers is. We've got the regions, we've got the species, the number of genomes and the mean RNs. So this appears to be a summary table for each species, uh, the region, uh, as well as the number of genomes uh, for that species and the number of copies. So something else that I've talked about in the past is I could perhaps do filter species, um, a species I perhaps know something about like Escherichia coli, run that and we should then get, yeah, so we have 958 genomes for E. coli, um, seven-ish uh, copies per genome. Okay. So that makes sense of what's going on. So I'm not sure why I need this at this point. Um, so what we can then say is we're going to um, want the, um, so let's say we want the uh, number of genomes and average number of 16S RNA gene copies per genome for each species. Okay, so that's what we want. Uh, and so genome numbers, um, perhaps what I'll call this instead of genomes will be something like um, n genomes, uh, copies, rn copies um, per species. That's really long, <laughs> um, but it's really descriptive. Uh, so let's, let's run with that and we'll have to update our code later when we see that we use it. Um, and so this is our input. And so what we're going to do is that we want to select the region, the genome ID, the species, ASV, and the count, um, because we want to know, um, need the data, need the counts by region and by genome for each species. Okay. And so that's why we're pulling those out. Uh, we're going to then, we want to group our ASVs by region and species. Um, yeah, and we then summarize. And so when I copied and pasted, my tabbing got kind of wonky here. So I'll go ahead and um, fix that a little bit, um, make it look a little bit cleaner. Um, and of course that filter is something I added on to make things look a little bit clearer for me as I'm testing. So we have n genomes and distinct. So this gets the um, number of distinct genomes per region species. Um, maybe I'll put that here. And then this is the average. Um, I'm kind of saying the what instead of the, the why, but um, here we're, we're adding, summing up the number of um, operons, basically. Uh, 
16s RNA uh, copies across all um, genomes for a species and region. Right. Okay. Um, and divide by number of genomes. Okay. So that looks pretty decent. I don't know. You can worry a little bit too much about the formatting of your comments. Okay. And then we're going to drop out all the comments. I'm sorry, drop out all the grouping. And let me go ahead then, and we can assign this to that variable. And so now we see that our code, at least for this initial chunk, um, looks pretty good. It's commented um, and is much more explicit about what's going on. I think this n genomes or n copies per species is more descriptive. Um, uh, so an rn copy is another verbiage for um, the 16s. Uh, the, the operon includes the 16s, 23s, and 5s. Um, maybe I'll say um, rn copies uh, per genome. Okay. So that looks good. This threshold, I'm not sure what that's about so far. Um, and let's see. What percentage of genomes have an ASV? This focuses on the most common ASV for each species. And again, we've called it this thing genome basis, which I'm not really sure what that's about. Um, maybe what I'll do is I'll go ahead and run this, and we can then look at genome basis. Um, yeah, and it's unhappy. Um, genomes number is not found, and that's because we changed it. Uh, so n genomes are n copies per species. And so um, we have this inner join here on my line 61. So if I save that, uh, and I forgot to run, I guess we needed this threshold uh, equals five. So if I run this again, um, we get some information about the summarize function. Let's look at genome basis as the plot. And we see in the lower right, we get these um, histograms for each of the four regions showing the maximum relative abundance. Um, and I think these are counting um, the ASVs uh, or perhaps the species, the species perhaps. Um, yeah, we can see uh, X is max relative bond. Um, I'm not really sure what it's counting. So uh, we'll have to figure that out. And then down here we have the region and the um, basically the percent of species perhaps where the most abundant ASV or most common ASV is more than 80%. Okay, so let's see how we got there. Uh, genome basis, and I'm going to comment that out so we don't, our studio is not tempted to run it. Um, and so again, we want to do our analysis um, for the species level um, at each region of the 16S RNA gene. Um, and we're going to want to count the number of um, the number of genomes where each ASV appears. Okay, um, and so and then we'll report I think the dominant ASV for each species. So um, we want to do our analysis at, for the species level at each um, uh, right. Um, Reach 16S. So we want to do our analysis for the species level for each region of the 16S gene. We will um, want to group our um, ASVs or want to group our genomes by ASVs and species to count the number of genomes that each. Um, ASV appears in, right? And so I think that gets these next two rows pretty well. Um, and so here we are then counting the number of genomes that each ASV 
appears in for each region and species. Okay. Okay, so that's good. And you know, you can always add white space. White space also helps with readability of our code. Um, again, you kind of develop your own style. Um, just think of you <laughs> uh, six months from now or a week from now trying to reread your code. Um, the other thing that we had gotten was a warning about groups. So I'll say um, drop. And so let's look at what this all looks like through this point. And we see that we've got our region, our species, the ASV, and the number of genomes that it was found in. Okay, so I think that's a nice variable. Um, we can also, like I said, filter uh, species equals extrarchia coli. And looking at this, we then see uh, there's a lot, <laughs> right? So this is the V19, the species, the ASV, and the number of genomes that it was found in. And so we'll want to know which, um, what, what is the uh, percent, what, which ASV um, shows up in the most E. coli genomes. I don't care about the name of the ASV. I want to know the percentage, right? And so this tells us the number of genomes that it's found in, which is useful um, for E. coli. And then I'm doing an inner join to bring um, in by my region the um, number of genomes as well as the number of copies per species. Okay, so as I'm saying this, I'm thinking, why didn't I just do this with like a group by or summarize? Um, and so maybe we'll think about that. We could think about refactoring the code, but for right now, I really just wanna figure out how does the code work, right? So bring in um, the number of uh, genomes and RN copies per species so we can scale um, our um, number of genomes that each ASV appeared in to get a percent dominance, okay? So that reads that in, um, and here then we do that mutate to get the relative abundance. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll change this to be dominance, because uh, that's more than relative abundance. It's a measure of dominance. So each ASV is gonna tell us the dominance. So for example, this one with 127 is more dominant than this one with one, okay? Well then we wanna return, or we want the most dominant, or the dominant, <laughs> we want the dominant um, ASV for each region and species, which is what we're doing here, right? Um, so we're summarizing to get the max number of genomes. Um, not sure why I did that. Oh, I know why. Um, so I did n genomes. I want the dominant ASV for each region and species and the number of um, genomes, or let me make this like a separate bullet point, right? Um, I want the number of genomes for each species and um, region so that we can filter our data to focus on those um, species with more genomes than the value of threshold. Okay. Right, and so um, if we only have one genome in our species, then uh, every ASV is gonna be dominant, right? It's gonna have a dominance of one. That's not really meaningful. So we wanna set a threshold as I do here to get some critical number of genomes, right? And so you'll recall up above, I had threshold five. And so um, this is um, set the minimum number of genomes per species. And so maybe I'll say 
min n genomes per species. So these names are really long, um, even for me. <laughs> um, but I think that's definitely more descriptive, right? And so here then I can say filter n genomes greater than or equal to my threshold. And again, I'll do my groups uh, equals drop, and that should be good. Okay. So let's see, does it run? Uh, Relabun not found. And um, right, so I changed the variable here to be dominance, right? So max um, Relabund, max dominance. I'm going to say um, dominant. Um, dominance. Uh, Max, I'll say max dominance. Okay, I think that works. And if we run all that, ah, I'm still getting an error. So max and genomes, min and genomes per species not found. Oh, and I probably forgot to run that up here. Now let's re run that. Now it's happy. Um, and I think what I'll do is I'll go ahead and save this. So genome basis was what I'd previously called it. Um, not super descriptive. So let's say, um, let's rename it uh, dominance, um, ASV dominance per species. And so what percentage of genomes have an ASV? So maybe I'll, what I'll say instead is, uh, dominance is the um, percentage of genomes that an ASV is found in. Okay. So if a ASV shows up in 20 of 25 genomes for a species, uh, its dominance is 0. 80. Okay. So again, this gives flavor, gives context, gives more of the why of what we are doing. Okay. And so then um, the other problem with these long names is I forget them and I seem to have the short term memory of a flea. Uh, so we want to change where we had genome basis before to ASV dominance per species. Um, we also, if we again look at the output here, have um, max dominance instead of max relabund. We want to fill by region. Our bin width is going to be 0 0.05. Running that, um, we then see that the count is the number of species. And so perhaps we can improve the way this looks by doing something like uh, y, uh, labs y equals um, number of genomes. And then X is going to be um, um, dominance of ASV per uh, species. Sorry, this isn't number of genomes, number of species. And that, that looks pretty good. And so then we want to know um, what percentage of species have a dominance, have a max dominance over 80%, okay? So that's good, and this is gonna be then max dominance. And if we sum, so if, if we do a logical, and if it's true, then the numerical value of true is one, the um, numerical value of false is zero. So if we sum up all those trues, we get ones, we divide by the total number, we get the fraction. Um, and I don't think this really helps. <laughs> um, so I'll delete that. And this then uh, gives us a fraction. Um, but again, because um, ah, I forgot to group by, um, or because I dropped the groups up here, the group by went away. So I want to group by, um, I think, region, right? Right. And so here we see that the V19 um, has very few species that are dominant, right? That have more than 80%, show up in more than 80% of the genomes. Whereas like the V4, V3, 4, and 4, 5 um, have more species where their uh, most dominant ASV is more than 
And then we have our conclusions here, right? Um, and great. So let's make sure we still agree. <laughs> Among the subregions, a majority of the species have an ASV that is found in more than 80% of the genomes for the full length sequences, the V19, uh, which was, um, yeah, which was this plot, right? Um, only 25% of the ASVs are found across more than 80% of the genomes. Uh, the most abundant ASVs, those that account for more than 80% of the RN copies, um, maybe I should say most common, right? Um, ASVs account for 46 to 74% of the genomes in the subregions and only 12% for the full length ASVs. And that's from this number here, right? So 46 to 74. 12%. Uh, this underscores the problem that a single ASV is unlikely to be representative of the diversity of the ASVs within a species, right? So if an ASV was pegged, you know, so like you might imagine that these ASVs for V4 are indicative of the diversity of a species. Um, but if we do it on an abundance basis, then we see that there's kind of a, a more skewed distribution. And certainly as you look at like the full length, uh, that, that story definitely goes away. So I'm happy with these conclusions. I'll go ahead and save this. And um, I need to make a rule uh, in my make file to generate this. And um, I'm gonna do git status so I can copy the name of the file here. And we will open up our make file. And let's make that rule. Um, so this is the, um, the dependency uh, and we're going to make the MD file. Uh, my file name's a little long. And we've got the same stuff, uh, the same other dependencies and recipe uh, for generating the dependent or generating the target. Um, uh, and this is the file that we want to render. So that's all good. I'm going to go ahead and copy. Uh, the target, and then we'll make it. Excellent. And I can look at the files. Um, I could do, say, open exploratory 2011 dominance um, files, and then the figures. Let's see if preview opens it for me, and I can see what they look like here. Uh, they're PNG files. The resolution's pretty crappy. Um, there are, of course, ways within uh, using ggsave to improve the resolution. But we see the plots that we had previously. And again, we could make this look prettier. But for now, we're just doing this exploratory data analysis. Ah, and I noticed a problem that I have dominance of ASVs per species rather than commonness. So let me fix that. Um, all right, I'll save that. I think we'll be good. I'll quit our studio, remake it. Uh, let me, I guess, double check that that took. So dominance, commonness, we're good. Um, get status. I'm going to remove my doodle file because it's not necessary any anymore. And then I will get add my make file. Oh, I never actually moved my issue branch. So let me go ahead and do git branch issue 32, double check that was the issue number, 32. It's probably silly to do this at this point, um, but whatever, For keep, keep the practice of having separate issue branches for each issue. Um, and I'll do git add make file, exploratory 2020 11. Uh, I'll put a star to get all those. When you use the star, it's really important that you run git status so you know what files you're committing. Sometimes people will use star or they'll do git add all. And they're adding a lot of stuff that they don't want to add. Um, there's lots of headaches and heartaches over people being overzealous in what they commit. So that all looks good. So I will then say git commit dash m calculate dominance and commonness of um, ASVs for each species and region. 
closes number 32. That's good. Git checkout master, git merge issue 32. We're good. Git push. And as we've seen, uh, we'll come up and we will close out the issue. Again, what I hope you take away from this episode is that it's really important to comment your code so that you send little notes to yourself of why you're doing things that you are in your code. Also, think about the readability of your code and whether or not your code is truly self-documenting. Sometimes people use variables like X or I or J, and those are not descriptive, right? They don't tell you anything um, other than that you're maybe lazy <laughs> and you like variables with one character. Um, try to have descriptive names. And as we saw, yeah, maybe your names can be too long and get too descriptive, but if you come back to the code in a couple weeks, which you most certainly will, then um, it helps to have that comments, those comments, it helps to have uh, those descriptive names for your variables. So anyway, I would encourage you to go back, look at your code, see how well you've commented some things. You know, perhaps go back to some dusty old piece of code, see if you remember what it did, and then do what I did here and kind of go line by line through your code, trying to figure out what it did. Um, you know, I kind of identified maybe one or two places in here that now that I've thought about it for two weeks, maybe I do things a little bit differently. And I could go back into the code, refactor it, and, and perhaps look at things a little bit differently. Anyway, I encourage you to adopt this practice. I will do my best as we go forward to do a better job of commenting my code, um, but I fully expect to slip. <laughs> um, and I expect that, you know, you're not perfect either. None of us are, we're all trying to get better as we do this. And so that's why I think that these videos have been really important for people is to help show them other ways of doing their coding practices. And as we learn more, hopefully we'll get better. Hopefully our analyses will get more reproducible and more robust. So keep practicing. Please tell your friends about these Code Club episodes. Uh, like and subscribe to the channel. We'll see you next time for another episode of Code Club.